Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is David Stahl. I'm president of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to another Tiny Dorm Concert evening. Uh, we have a very special guest with us tonight. I am uh, so excited to welcome Edwin Outwater to our faculty as the new music director of SFCF. Uh, to so many within the sound of my voice, you know who Edwin is. Uh, he has just been a remarkable presence in the field of music uh, for quite some time, working across the world as a major conductor of the top orchestras. Uh, but more than that, doing exciting projects, ranging from collaborations with Edwin Marcellus and Rene Fleming, uh, to the fact that he also, uh, you'll find him doing things like conducting Metallica and Serpico Symphony at the Chase Center. Uh, Edwin's dynamism uh, is extraordinarily well known, and uh, but what may not be as well known is the kind of teacher Edwin is. Uh, what inspired us at the conservatory was Edwin's ability to reach our students, uh, to bring repertoire alive for them, uh, to so quickly bring them up to speed on the technical requirements of being a great orchestral player, uh, but to do that with enthusiasm and joy and a real caring for the ensemble. Uh, Edwin is everything uh, that we could imagine for a music director. We spent two full years uh, looking for someone, and I have to say, had just superb candidates. Uh, we had an embarrassment of riches when it came to people uh, who were with us, and I will say some of those will return in the future, of course, but ladies and gentlemen, tonight is entirely about Edwin Outwater and his friends will be joining us. So ladies and gentlemen, Edwin Outwater. Edwin, are you with us? Hi, David. How are you? I'm doing great, Edwin. It's, it's a pleasure to see you. Am I, am I talking with you in Chicago, I believe? I'm in, yeah, I'm at home in Chicago right now in, in my study, and uh, I'm very excited. I've never done one of these before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, the tiny door experience changes us all. It, uh, uh, it's been terrific to be able to bring our students and faculty and alumni together, actually, over the last number of weeks. Uh, Hank Mao, our Associate Dean, and Aubrey Bergauer, uh, our VP for Strategic Communications, and actually the founder of our new Center for Innovative Leadership uh, put this program together. Uh, but it's been a means for us uh, to allow our students and faculty to continue to play. So Edwin, we're very excited about that. Thanks a lot. It's, uh, it's great. For this concert, I just tried to gather, uh, you know, San Francisco has been home to me for so long, uh, spiritually, and uh, I want to uh, try to gather in this concert some people with whom I've worked for a long time. Some of them are old friends. Some of them are people I've met more recently, and all of them are either faculty or alumni of SFCM. That's great. Edwin, so tell me, what, what excites you most about taking on this post as music director, and, and what do you look forward to in the years ahead and working with the, the students in the conservatory? I think two things. I mean, there's the very basic satisfaction and joy of teaching. Um, it's something I've actually done, like you mentioned, all along uh, from the very, very beginning of my career as a conductor. The first uh, job I ever had was a, was a youth orchestra in Santa Barbara. And there has never been a time uh, where I haven't been educating in some way throughout my entire career. And I think uh, it has been consistently one of the most rewarding things uh, that I've done. And I, I think in recent years, I've really wanted to prioritize teaching and, and make that a bigger part of what I do. And uh, I think it would have to be a, in a way also that fits in kind of my general character as a musician, the kind of the creative stuff I do, the uh, kind of experimental things. And, and SFCM was this incredible opportunity for me to kind of do the traditional kind of teaching to carry on all this incredible, like I like to say, artisanal teaching that we all get as musicians with our teachers and pass it on to, to all the students, but also that this is such a lab and such a forward thinking place, I knew that I would be, you know, fit right into your tribe, essentially. And when we certainly felt that way, I have to say, uh, we had a, a fantastic committee of, of our of faculty, essentially drawn from the San Francisco Symphony, uh, who obviously admire you tremendously, but were very thoughtful and highly objective. But in the end, it was your, your great work that inspired them. Um, as far as partnerships, the kind of work you've done, uh, you know, there's a, a really a tremendous, compliment from Michael Tilson Thomas, one of the most you know, innovative conductors on the scene today. I know this partnership between you and Michael has been very special and influential for you. Uh, what are the kinds of things that, that you've learned from Michael and what are the things that uh, you think in looking ahead that you hope to do with the Cruz Symphony and, and extending that tradition going forward? Well, I think Michael is a communicator and is able to describe things in words in such a precise and eloquent, eloquent way 
and kind of make it come alive as an educator, the way he, he speaks and the way he does things. And to be around him, I also thing I noticed working with him all these years is he always kind of makes a left turn intellectually, you know, that when you start a conversation with him, it immediately veers. And I thought, always found that so exciting as someone, you know, who communicates with him all the time that I would walk out and kind of every uh, conversation or, or musical experience is kind of like, wow, how did that happen? And uh, I've kind of learned to do that a little bit over the years, but to kind of question the premise of everything in a sense, um, and he always does that, but he has such a deep respect for the tradition of classical music, which he, you know, he says is 1200 years old and has been carried on for so long. And the way he's able to combine those two things uh, has, has kind of influenced me so deeply. I can't, like a great teacher, any great teacher, you can't really do anything musically without them being involved. You know, even though you've made it your own, there's right. this kind of deep, deep, kind of almost biological, you know, subconscious thing that they've imprinted, which I've certainly, so I've absorbed those left turns and those kind of uh, premise questioning things from him, definitely. Though I was, I was always kind of ready to do that anyway, but he's shown me how to do it way better. <laughs> well, in any event, uh, I should say when, when uh, we announced the appointment, Mike made a point of calling me and just saying how thrilled he was because he said, you fired absolutely uh, the most forward thinking person in the profession. So it's really, really high praise and Edward, congratulations. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to turn this evening over to uh, our new music director, Edwin Outwater. I'm gonna thank my colleagues. Uh, it's like Jake Nisley's online, Chen, Mario, and Mr. Bates is with us, Marty Breckenridge. Uh, it's, a, it's a great lineup tonight, but the thing that brings these folks together really is not just the tremendous artistry, which you're aware of, but we get to see every day is their great teaching and the work they do for their students. And there's a level of commitment there, which inspires all of us. So Edwin, we're so excited to have you on the team and at SFCM and uh, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, David. Well, welcome everybody uh, to our virtual living room here. Uh, this is the final Tiny Dorm concert of this series, which has been a really great success. This is all live, uh, what you're going to hear, which makes it extremely exciting for us and hopefully for you. And uh, we're all, you know, socially distancing from each other. So you'll see lots of kind of amazing uh, kind of efforts to make it uh, work, you know, when you don't have a pianist in the house or you don't have, you know, someone else to sing with. And, and we, you'll see some amazing solutions. We'll talk about that. Um, as I mentioned to David, I've gathered a bunch of friends uh, whom I've known a long time and they all agreed to do that. So do this concert live. And I'd like to, first of all, thank them uh, so much for doing this. It's just pure generosity and goodwill on their part towards me and towards the conservatory. And I am eternally grateful, but uh, that's kind of where these friendships come. And, and I just can't tell you how appreciative I am. Uh, there are comments running on YouTube, on Facebook, I believe. And so feel free to chime in. I see the YouTube comments and I will try to chime in as appropriate as my friends are playing. And I'd like to thank uh, Harry Winston, who has been an incredible support of this uh, experience. So I think we can start out pretty soon. Uh, I think we're going to start with my friend Jake Nisley. Jake, are you there? Hey, Jake, how are you? Great, how are you doing, Edwin? And congratulations on your new position. We're all very thrilled to have oh, you. Thanks so much. I, if you don't know Jake, uh, if you're watching, Jake is principal percussion of the San Francisco Symphony. He is on the faculty of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. He is an amazing, amazing musician. And he is one of my favorite people to conduct. You know, when you're a conductor on stage, you look back and you see faces and you see people reacting uh, to what you're doing or to the music in general. And Jake is, as if you, any of you have watched the uh, San Francisco Symphony, he is a spark. There's just total joy that you get from Jake when he is playing and uh, it radiates visually and of course in the way he plays in sound too. We've done some amazing things together, uh, lots of classical repertoire, but Jake is a great drum set player. I specifically remember working on a concert with Seal. Remember that, Jake? <laughs> <laughs> and we've been in all sorts of different situations. Uh, and uh, you're going to give us a little bit of tour of your, this is your home. Uh, you recently did a video um, with your son of uh, some Bach on the marimba. And that's how we're going to start this one. And your son started by saying he hated Bach. And what was really great about that video is that you seem to 
turn him around. Even on your own kid, it seems to work this Jake magic. Um, and uh, so does he still hate Bach? I don't think he's ever hated Bach. I think, he, you know, he was just letting me know that it was time to move on and work on something else that day. So um, and you call it the terrible twos for a reason, I think. So. Yeah, but it was amazing how you how you turned it around. That is a great skill as a dad, and as you'll hear as a, as a musician as well. Here's uh, you're going to start with some Bach, right, Jake, and then kind of take us on a tour of your percussion mind uh, these days during the pandemic. Yeah, I thought I would just play a few snippets from a few different things, uh, give you a taste test. Obviously, percussion is not a singular instrument like a lot of my other colleagues. So. Um, I also live on the 20th floor of a high rise, so I cannot practice my drum set or timpani or certain instruments here. So marimba tends to work. I'm gonna play a little bit of snare drum and then I'm gonna show you guys, um, everyone out there, kind of what I do as a little less formal type of practicing on my tambourine. I'm gonna jam along to some uh, Thundercat at the end here. So uh, I'm gonna start with a little snippet of the Sarabande from the first cello suite. a tool I use a lot for our students. As Edwin mentioned, um, I'm the co-chair of the percussion department at the San Francisco Conservatory with my colleagues Ed Steffen and Jack Van Geem. And just this week, uh, famous percussionist, pedagogue, writer, John S. Pratt, uh, famous for his rudimental sort of marching band snare drum, uh, he passed away this week. So we are in the process of making a memorial video with all of the students in the percussion studio splicing together, all of us, including Jack, Ed, and myself, um, a little ditty called Drum Corps on Parade. So, got some snare drum here for you.
last little ditty here. Uh, I'm just going to show you what I do in a maybe a little less formal setting. Um, this is mostly for my students, but also for those of you who are kind of wondering where I get that spark from or how I keep that spark. It's by, you know, listening to the kind of music I really dig. This is some Thundercat, and I'm going to improvise on the tambourine here. Thanks so much, Jake. That was amazing. Thanks for a little percussion uh, seminar right at the beginning. And uh, you'll get to hear more of Jake when this is all kind of, we're all back on stage. He's such an amazing friend and musician. And what I forgot to mention before we start is what a great teacher he is. Um, I get to go in his sectionals uh, when he's coaching and the look, the kind of enthusiasm he brings um, in a small percussion room is the same that he brings to like a 2800 person theater like Davies Symphony Hall. And it's an amazing thing to be in there. I hope we can show some of that online someday. And um, just to see the way the students look and listen to Jake and react to what he does um, is, is incredibly inspiring. So I'm looking forward to more sectionals too, Jake. Likewise. Thank you everyone so much. All right. Moving to our next guest. This next gentleman is an alumnus of the San Francisco Conservatory. We actually didn't meet in San Francisco. We met in Chicago where he was a member or is a member of the Ryan Opera Center, which is the lyric opera of Chicago's um, incredible uh, training center. And we've done a lot of work together, uh, some really unforgettable stuff and we'll talk about. Uh, and he studied at San Francisco Conservatory with Cesar Uloa and uh, please welcome Mario Rojas. Hello, Maestro. How are you? Welcome to the conservatory. Thank you. You're also in Chicago, right? No, I'm in Mexico. Oh, you're kidding. In Mexico. Wow. I finished the Ryan Center at the beginning of March, right before everything started unraveling. And I luckily, I came back to do a concert to Mexico here. Then I went back to finish up stuff there. And that was a week that every, that everything happened. Yeah. So are you with your family? Yes, I'm with my family. Everyone is very happy. A couple of people are here. Hello. Not, not too many responsible. The people that we've already been with for a whole rest of three weeks. Escuché un perro? Yes, there's a dog somewhere around here. Hi, <laughs> Well, it was so fun to work with you at the Ryan, uh, Mario. We did an amazing uh, excerpt from uh, Florencia in El Amazonas with uh, Antony. Yeah. It was like such a highlight. It kind of made everyone's hair stand on end. You're you're definitely a tenor. What would you say like the qualities of tenors are for for the for our audience out there? I think we're too self indulgent with our own music, for wow. sure. For sure, we love too much our our own music. 
Yeah, and, and are you guilty of that at times? Oh, so much, so much, so much. <laughs> well, we're about to hear an example. Uh, what's the first piece you're going to sing for us, Mario? I would love to sing uh, a song by Mario, well, not by Mario Lanza, but that Mario Lanza made very famous, Be My Love. And obviously it's recorded with our dear friend, Craig Terry, which I think he's listening. He is. Uh, so shout out to Craig Terry for recording this for, for us. All right, thanks, Mario. Be my love for no one else can end this yearning, this need that you and you alone create. Just feel my arms the way you filled my dreams, the dreams that you've inspired with every sweet desire. Be my love, and with your kisses set me burning. One kiss is all I need to seal my faith, and hand in hand we'll find love's promised land. There'll be no one but you for me eternally. If you will be my love. And hand in hand, we'll find love's promised land. There'll be no one but you for me. Eternally, if you will be my love. There. Wow, bravo, Mario, Mario. There's my audience. <laughs> There's the audience. So, before your next song, tell me a little bit about your experience at the San Francisco Conservatory as a student, what it was like studying with Cesar. Oh, it was fantastic. First of all, the, the city, I, it just, I fell in love immediately with it. And the conservatory being so close to everything, being so close to the opera, being so close to the, to the symphony center. It's such a fantastic place that invites to collaborate for sure. And I, I had the pleasure to sing two operas there, Elixir of Love, which I'll sing many, many times in my life, which I'm very, very grateful. And Tragedy de Carmen and stunning there with Cesar was just fantastic. fantastic. It's a really wonderful department there. And as you can see, yeah. alumni like you, uh, we're very, very lucky to have Cesar we're there. Working very hard for sure. Yeah. For sure. Now, you have one more song for us uh, called Te Quiero Dijiste. Um, what, yeah. what would, can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, it's a, it's a very sweet Mexican song. A lot of people tend to think it's a love song just because it says, I love you, you said to me, but it's, it's talking about this, the, the passing of their child and how they remember this sweet, beautiful angel basically in their life. But it's such a sweet, beautiful song. It really, I, I remember singing it to my grandma. Uh, right before she passed away, so it, it has a lot of meaning for me. Uh, and yeah, it's a very beautiful song. I sang it, I've sung it a couple of times. Well, can't wait to hear it, Mario. It sounds so personal to you, and thank you for sharing it with us in this strange virtual world. It, it, we need this yeah. right now. Which, which, yeah, we all have to do a little something to, to stay connected with all of us. So, there's Craig Terry again. Oh, learning from technology, for sure. Even though, why is it not playing? Sorry. 
technical problems there. Te quiero, dijiste, tomando mis manos entre tus manitas de blanco marfil y sentí en mi pecho un fuerte latido, después un suspiro y luego el chasquido de un beso febril, muñequita linda de cabellos de oro. De dientes de perlas, labios de rubí, dime si me quieres, como yo te adoro, si de mí te acuerdas, como yo de ti. Y a veces escucho un eco divino que envuelto en la brisa parece decir si te quiero mucho, 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 tanto como entonces, siempre hasta That, that for some reason the track got off in the middle of it but i couldn't stop i was my heart was already in it that's how you do it the show yeah. must go on mario that's, that why, that's why you need conductors that's <laughs> why we need conductors and good ones mario that was so beautiful i, I didn't know that song and it's, it's it's really really touching and you sang it so beautifully thank yeah. you for joining us today and thank uh, you and welcome to your family. To your family. Yeah, give my best to your family in Mexico. Yes. Uh, maybe we'll see them in a little bit. Maybe the dog. Yes, for sure. They're uh, very excited. And uh, everybody, keep your eyes out for this guy. I think Mario is an amazing tenor, and you'll be seeing and hearing much more of him in the classical Thank music. Thank you, Maestro. Tour. Thank you. Okay. Gracias, Mario. Adios, Maestro. Adios. A la vista, baby. <laughs> Our next guest. Um, is a very old friend of mine. We've been working together since almost the beginning of my career. Um, he's a composer, but also performer and DJ. Uh, and he is a terrific, terrific friend. The amount of projects we've worked on together are kind of countless by this point. Um, and I want you all to say hello to Mason Bates. Hello, Edwin. How are you? Uh, you know, I'd rather be hanging out in the flesh but yeah. glad that we can do the Zoom thing. So I'm trying to think the first thing we did together was maybe in Kitchener-Waterloo, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we did Kitchener-Waterloo and um, we've always been pretty simpatico. I think we connect on the level of, of the MTT kind of joyous adventure thing. You know, it's gotta be a little weird, it's gotta be challenging, but you yeah. wanna um, communicate and um, it's so cool that you're part of the conservatory now. I think uh, they're lucky to have you there too. I mean, if I had invested in composers, you know, back then in Kitchener, I would have done very well with Mason Bates, you know, in the composer stock market. You've done such incredible things. Oh, in it's your a thing. It's the stock yeah. market. For there's a, there's a, yeah, there's a hedge fund. But um, you've done such amazing things that so many amazing opera recently, uh, about Steve Jobs. You just have so many premieres, associations now with the Kennedy Center, also with the Chicago Symphony. 
of the San Francisco Symphony. How do you fit teaching into it? What is what is what part of it is? Why do you teach? You you don't have to, right? Um, there, there are two main reasons for me. Uh, one is that when you have to articulate the way you should do something, you learn it better yourself, and so having to articulate something to young composers who I really believe in, um, it kind of helps me artistically on my own level. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, that's kind of like something that feeds back to me. I really believe in the conservatory and I believe that, you know, any city needs a lot of young musicians uh, kind of coming in and um, making the music scene what it is. And so everything that's happened in the conservatory of the past you know, decade or so um, has been really exciting. And so it, it's, it's a great place for me to, to be as a composer. Also, um, most of the time I spend in this room um, and I, I like my room, uh, but it's good for me to get out occasionally. So I, I, it's, it's, I love the area. I mean, I think Mario said, you know, you go up, you need the symphony of the opera, the jazz center, the ballet, um, and my students I really care about. So, it's been a really good fit. I'm excited to be joining you there. Uh, just having people like you there and so many great colleagues. Uh, it's, it's, it's a family I kind of already know, but uh, it's going to be exciting to see what we can all do together there. And it's cool to have a peek into a composer's studio if you haven't. Yours, I've been in, in, in real life, and it's, uh, it's, it's really cool. You started showing me uh, your new piece, uh, Philharmonia Fantastique, which I was supposed to premiere. Uh, with the Chicago Symphony just a few weeks ago, and we're going to do it soon. But it was one of the first musical kind of uh, things that we lost, that I lost actually during this during this time. Tough times. Um, yep. Well, uh, today what you just heard the other guys do is not exactly what you're going to hear from me. I'm doing more like a uh, light interlude. Um, I'm going to just be DJing, which is not like playing instrument. Um, however, I thought it'd be a nice thing to add to this because electronic music and electronic dance music has really impacted me. Um, it's impacted the way I think about texture and of course the way I think about rhythm. It's harder than it, it appears, you know, like dance music is, is more complicated than you would analyze it as, as to be. Um, and so uh, I found like for me to really get the essence of the music in my system, I really have to go out and do it. I can really have to go out and DJ. It's not enough to just sit home and, and listen to it and enjoy it. And so really living or dying in some of these clubs with weird gear and kind of sketchy mafioso owners and whatnot, um, it's really impacted the way I think about music. And particularly it's made me think about transitions differently. And so I'm gonna play for you like four little tracks that are kind of in the jazz house zone. And just, you know, migrating between one to the next, there's always a third place where the two meet. And so that's how DJing has kind of impacted the way I think about musical form and texture. Awesome. Well, I think we're ready to start and we may cut away to some people grooving to your, to your, to your uh, DJ set. Would that be okay? Um, that would be encouraged. And in fact, that would relieve the kind of boring picture of me just spinning records. So yeah, do it. Wait. Thank you. 
Fastest, shortest DJ set in the history of the world, right here. Awesome. Hey, so one quick thing though. Um, 
you know, a lot of times in electronic music, you don't get a lot of soul. It's kind of mechanical. Yeah. It's really nice to get something that combines live musicians or at least recordings of them um, and beats because it adds what's missing. So I've always really been interested in bringing live musicians into DJ sets. And uh, some of those tracks had some really cool brass arrangements and whatnot. So um, definitely not as cool as Chen playing the fiddle or Mario singing or Marnie singing, uh, but a, a light musical interlude. Well, Jake had his tambourine out while you were DJing, uh, Mason, just so you know. I saw some dance moves from Jake that were, that raised the temperature in the room, you know. Well, thanks so much, Mason. It's so nice of you to join. I can't wait to see you soon and keep working and on to the next piece and uh, have fun in your beautiful studio. I'm so jealous of that room. It's amazing. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, a lot of if that didgeridoo could talk. It could tell some stories. Um, OK, later. I'll be listening. Next, we have OK, a lot of these guys are old friends. Uh, this next gentleman is maybe my, God, I can't, it, we go way back, Chen Zhao. Hi, Chen. How are you, Edwin? Good. So we met in high school. Uh, you went to a school called Crossroads in Los Angeles. I played in the orchestra. And uh, I first met you essentially giving you rides home, right? That's right. You were my ride home. On a, uh, I remember you were driving a Volvo station wagon. A sedan, actually. So, oh, hmm. But how long have you been in the States at that point? Um, just two, one or two years. Right. So you were kind I of new to us. Yeah. And uh, I remember as we drove home, you would point to cars and say how much you liked fast cars. Uh, yeah. Do you still like fast cars? Sort of. But right now, no, just the violin. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have such, we our paths crossed uh, in high school, our paths crossed at or South Florida at the New World Symphony. Um, then we both ended up working for the San Francisco Symphony together. Um, and it's one of the great joys of my life uh, is, is just that we grew up together and seeing how our lives have changed, seeing your wonderful family whom we'll meet in a little bit. And, uh, and also one thing that hasn't changed is your approach to music. And uh, we had the same teacher. Um, my conducting teacher was your violin teacher in high school. And one time I remember him telling me, even from the very first time he saw you, uh, he said, even when Chen plays a, a C major scale, he makes it sound musical. And like, he can't not be musical. Uh, it's it's a know, very- he, he never told me that. <laughs> he would never tell you. Uh, but uh, you have music running through your veins. Uh, what What is it? Why, why, why do you have to even play scales musical? Why, I mean, we know why, but there's something special about you. You really try to speak and express something through your instrument at all times. Well, I think um, lately I've been playing scales without vibrato because <laughs> just for intonation, I'm finding the spacing between my fingers more, to be more precisely. I guess I grew up because um, it's possible that I think Heitro Oyama also did a lot of you know fingertip vibratos between the notes. So he did he did um, uh, teach me scales that way. Yeah. And you love, you You know, he was, a, he is still with us and he's a, he was an amazing teacher, studied with the Gingold and Primrose and, yeah. and, and you have a love of kind of old school violin playing, don't you? Absolutely. Yeah, I used to listen to a lot of that when I was, at, um, um, I guess my first two years in college at Curtis. And I also, uh, you know, I was a master's student here at the SFCM. Um, so that time I did a lot of uh, listening and trying to figure out why people have so much characters, so much colors in their playing, why every player sounds so different and unique from the 30s and the 40s and 50s. Um, and then uh, when I was uh, studying with Cam Camilla Wicks at the conservatory, um, she also gave me a lot of insights on that. And then she also, um, you know, there are times that I would sort of imitate, you know, Chrysler or Michel Alman or something. And then she would say, well, you know, that was back in the old days. They all do that. And, you know, now I think we should do something different. You know? So I think, you know, it really opens up, you know, that hearing someone who actually grew up in that um, uh, the era and, and uh, that she's actually following the trending too, to, to see, to search for something new, something, new ideas. And I think that's the same thing that I look for in, um, 
students too. I I try to pass on some traditions from how I used to play or how my teachers like Felix Gallimere or Camilla Wicks and how these great masters of the Amadeus Quartet, the boarding quartets, I still have their some of their uh, bowings for their parts and, and I try to pass on some of the tradition. And also I'm, um, I want to encourage students to do um, a lot of creative ideas and I will tell them if you know, if something is not right or it's just, it's way, it doesn't, it's sort of like if you're, uh, if you're making pasta and putting soy sauce in there, you know, probably not a good idea. And um, so I, I think, I think I want to bring in a lot of tradition to their playing. And once they graduate, then they can find, you know, once they learn the traditional way of playing uh, the Viennese schools or uh, some of the old masters, how they used to play. And I think it would be nice and that that would be something that they'll, they'll use that in the future and for whatever the musical ideas or artistic ideas that they have. I think, uh, you know, like I said, we've known each other for so long. And two things I would say just in response to that is uh, your, your players have gotten, your playing, I think, has gotten better and better you know, over the years as, you, as you've gotten older, like you don't stop getting better or experimenting or, or you know, becoming something new. And it's just been wonderful to hear that over the years. And I would say also that um, your students, now, now that I've met a few of them, you are passing on that kind of character and personality to their playing. And they're, they're, they, they, I can, whatever you're doing, it's working because I can feel that kind of undefinable kind of personality in all of these different violinists that I've come across who, who you train. So yeah. um, there's a lot more to come for you, I think, as a teacher and as a musician. And I think with this new mustache, uh, you're really gonna be, uh, change the world. That is the first time I've ever seen uh, the facial hair from it's Chet. It's the first time for me too. Yeah, yeah it kind of works. So uh, this is also a momentous event because you're playing in public with your wife uh, for the first time. Yes, Chet, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't move the piano out, and um, and so we're, yeah. So anyway, so we have a, a nice Yamaha keyboard set up. <laughs> yeah, oh, but it sounds, see I promise it sounds just the same on a, on a, you know streaming. <laughs> well, you'll see her in a second, but um, eventually, yeah. just it's it's more about the room logistics that we can't see her now, but we'll see her in a bit. But I'd like to thank uh, Carrie Abrams for joining us, and, and why don't you introduce its three Heifetz transcriptions, right? Yes. So um, I will start with Rachmaninoff uh, Daisies. Um, that song was written in 1916, and it's one of the, um, Rachmaninoff's six songs, Opus 38, and it was dedicated to a singer um, that he was with at the time. And uh, the second piece uh, is Prokofiev's uh, Gavat, which I actually just discovered uh, a week ago when um, you know when you asked me to play something, I was trying to figure something out. And it's like, should I play something with just violin? And everybody's playing Bach right now. So I thought maybe I'll try something, find something different. And this piece was written in 1918. And uh, coincidentally, it's, that was when the big last, the last big pandemic was, uh, also in 1918. And Prokofiev was actually in San Francisco at that time. Um, and so it just, I think it has that, piece definitely has, um, you know, something slightly comical and slightly sinister. And uh, perhaps of something that he was experiencing, um, you know, going through, but also, but ultimately it's a, it's a dance suite for piano and the Heifetz has a wonderful transcription. So I thought I would share that with you guys. And the last piece is just for fun. It's uh, the ain't, It Ain't Necessarily So uh, by George Gershwin as a popular song. Um, with music um, that he was, you know, was written in 1935, I think, was it? Yeah, and um, and I like that piece because it is, has it's been covering with a lot of um, jazz musicians in the 50s and 60s. Everybody has their own take on that, and so it is really really fun to um, to to listen to. And I actually saw my first uh, uh, Porgy and Bess uh, opera in Norway, uh, of all places, and uh, so that was really a memorable. Um, performance so anyway i'm yeah I'd like to share that with you all let's do it oh, okay
Carrie Abram. That's Carrie. So the last piece I'm going to, uh, it's also high pitch transcription that ain't necessary. So, but I've added um, a few thing, a few lines to kind of make it my own version to just play solo. So.
Amazing, Chen. Thank you so much. That was an amazing set. The comments were going crazy. Uh, all my friends were texting me and telling oh. me how awesome you sounded. Hi, everyone. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Did you now? Can you bring Carrie back, or did she disappear? Yeah. Yeah. For a bow. You gotta get. Don't be so shy, Carrie. And, yeah. and is Mila coming too? There's Mila. Yes. You wanted to be on the on the live stream. Mila, are you practicing your violin a lot? Yeah. Good. Did you practice today? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still time. No, it's earlier in California. So uh, thanks, Chen. It's it's so great to do. Thank this. you. And, and, Thank uh, you for having me on your show. Oh. My, yeah, it's funny. It's a show. This is crazy. Well, we have one more uh, amazing guest uh, before we, we end this section of Tiny Dorm. Uh, she is someone I've known more recently and, and have done some amazing things with, uh, particularly in the San Francisco Symphony uh, Soundbox uh, venue. Uh, we do some Goliath, some other things, um, and is just an amazing performer. Please welcome Marnie Breckenridge. Hello. Hi, Marnie. Woo! Hi there. Well, you know, I've always felt that you're a kindred spirit to me. Uh, I think likewise, because both of us get pulled into doing all sorts of crazy things <laughs> that and I, I don't I think, you know, I've heard you sing in so many different styles, play so many different roles and, and you do it all so beautifully. And and I think, you know, in this age of, oh, this person is only good at this. this I, I don't always believe that. I think a lot of artists for instance, every orchestra musician can play every solo by every composer beautifully. And and I'm wondering, like, how, I don't even know how I can switch from, for instance, Metallica to Mozart. I, I don't know how I do it. Uh, but do you do you have any insight, like, when you switch from one situation to another, like, how, what, 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 what lets you do that, do you think? Oh, that's an interesting question. I've never been asked, like, exactly, or that question exactly that way. I think it's, if you appreciate the style and you can somehow get into it from that person who loves it maybe even more than you do, then you can somehow start to um, let it be part of you. I think it's also like, what do pe people listen to? I don't think that I would necessarily be a great uh, s singer for the band Metallica. You know, I mean, I could try, I could probably scream some high notes, but do you know what I mean? Like, I think if you appreciate the style yourself, then you can get into it. Um, I think I've, I've also been kind of a gifted mimic my whole life, which has hindered me in many ways because I think it took me a long time to figure out what my own voice was. I would try to copy other opera singers or copy pop singers and finding my own voice was something that, um, you know, really started to happen at the conservatory when I went there for my masters and then throughout my life. And it's fun to switch from, from a genre to genre, but it's also, it can be difficult, you know, cause Broadway feels a little bit more forward and sideways and opera feels more inich and upper and lots more breath support, you know, so it's it's an interesting trick going from style to style. Yeah, I think so too. It's like, uh, I think it's for a singer particularly. I, and um, I think, how do I say this? Uh, what you said resonated with me, like in my work going back and forth is you have to really believe in the, you know, love the genre, understand right. it. And, yeah. And, you can't you can't fake that. So I think if you have the capacity to love a lot of different styles of music, it makes it easier. I think. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> so speaking of that, um, tell tell us what you could knowing you. It could be anything that you sing tonight, uh, and it'll well, be good. But what is know, it going to be tonight? Originally, I'd I'd wanted to maybe do something um, you know that we'd done before with San Francisco Symphony Soundbox, and we've done some Missy Mazzoli music together, and and the Goliov and. But trying to coordinate that with some type of background accompaniment or, you know, even doing it a cappella was much more of a difficult task than uh, I could put together this week. So um, I have decided to sing stuff kind of more from the heart. And also this last few weeks, I have not been singing a ton because we're all in the house together and mommy's voice is really loud. And uh, <laughs> So I've been trying to kind of give their ears a break. And also it's been a time of transition for all of us and a time of uh, reflection and, um, you know, even a little bit of sadness, um, you know, just on a personal level, you know, all of my gigs between now and July are just gone, you know, all of my engagements. And I know Mason had brought that up too. And, you know, we're all kind of trying to figure out what this is that's happening besides just the obvious, which is, you know, a, a life-threatening disease that is a pandemic and we're all being affected by it. But 
I decided to just offer songs from the heart that I could sing in my sleep and they mean something to me. And the first one that popped into my mind was Till There Was You, because the whole reason we're doing this concert is because we finally got you, Edwin, at the conservatory. And uh, <laughs> so that was a wonderful feat. Uh, and I'm so glad that that happened. So this, I thought, oh, until there was you, you know, like you just fit the bill. And so I'm dedicating that one to you. Oh my goodness. And then the second song is um, a piece that is kind of a, I think it's my go-to comfort piece whenever I need a boost, when I need to like hear especially a feminine voice, Nina Simone, who's been one of my all time favorite singers. I don't sing like her. I can't even match her at all. I'm doing it in my own style, but I appreciate the words that um, Leslie Bricuse wrote and this Anthony Newley wrote the music for her. And it's all about, you know, look, I can't wait till I'm feeling good again, you know, after this disease, after this COVID thing that we're all dealing with. I can't wait to just be like, you know what? It's done. I feel better. But in the meantime, we can appreciate all the stuff that we do have in our lives and our people and our friends and making music together, even like this in this kind of strange world. Here I am in my dining room, you know, um, but uh, the, the last lines in the song say um, sleep in peace when day is done. And this old world is a new world in a bold world for me and I feel I'm feeling good so that's my wish for all of us um to say it now and maybe say it even louder at the end of all this that I'm feeling good thanks Marty looking forward can't you're wait welcome to can't wait let me see if I can cue this up here can you hear it Amazing! Oh, 
I was conducting along. Could you see me conducting? Microphones were cracking. Sorry. <laughs> awesome. So what's your grand finale? Nina Simone, right? And you have some special guests? Yes, I have some special guests. Thank you. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Birds flying high, you know how I feel. Sun in the sky, you know how I feel. Breeze is drifting on by, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, it's a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Ba-dum, 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 ba Fish in the sea, you know how I feel. River running free, you know how I feel. Blossom on the tree, you know how I feel. It's a new dawn, it's a new day, a new life for me. And I'm feeling good. Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. ba ba Kept going. da 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 Dragonfly out in the sun, you know what I mean. Butterflies all having fun, you know what I mean. Sleep in peace when day is done, that's what I mean. And this old world is a new world in a bold world. What are you, can you introduce your kids? Yes, this is my little daughter, Alexa Loomis. She's Hello. eight years old. Hello. And my son, 10 year old, Gus Loomis. Hey, Gus. <laughs> well, that was amazing. Thanks for, for letting the family be a part of this. And um, I'm, I'm gonna say, say a few words just at the end. I mean, I doing this is really interesting. This is my first kind of online hosting. I don't know how my fellow artist, Marty, how you felt, but uh, you, Wild. You, yeah. Yeah, you become familiar and comfortable with the rituals of going on stage, of walking on, of seeing and hearing the audience, of hearing the music come back at you, of feeling the audience. And it's challenging uh, to do these concerts online. And so many of uh, our musician friends, you guys tonight, and, uh, and musicians all over the world are putting this music out and sharing it with us um, while we're in our homes during this. And there's a, in, what I've learned from tonight, there's a tremendous amount of risk and in, in, in adventure um, involved in doing this. It's, it's, it's tricky and it just shows kind of the courage and the heart and the goodwill of all of you guys uh, for, for doing this with all of us tonight. I mean, even me, I host and I talk and I conduct all the time, but it, it just feels different. And it's like stepping onto a brand new stage and having a brand new adventure. And that is a good part of it as well, even though it can be a little scary and different sometimes. So I just wanna thank all of you. Uh, it means so much to me personally uh, that you're joining me, that you're welcoming me to the uh, conservatory. I have never had a welcome like this online on a Zoom uh, meeting. And uh, it's something of course I'll never forget. And, uh, and I can't wait to make music with all of you again um, in real life, but I think what we're doing now in the meantime ain't bad at all. So uh, with great appreciation to, to Jake, uh, to Mason, to Mario, uh, to Marnie and to Chen uh, for joining us. Thank you so much, guys. 
Uh, this is the final uh, tiny dorm of this um, set of them, but uh, it's already been seen, these concerts, by over 10,000 people. And if you do like what you heard tonight, feel free to share these on social media. They're still up on YouTube. Um, we can kind of pass this along and keep the goodwill flowing. Uh, the good, Another bit of good news is there is going to be a round two of Tiny Dorm, which will start on May 1st. So watch this space. Uh, I'd like to thank the incredible uh, San Francisco Conservatory crew, um, who, some of whom I'm looking at on my Zoom meeting right now, Kelly and Aubrey and Jason. Um, thank you so much for making this all happen. Um, it's really an incredible and quite complex job uh, that you guys all do. And uh, keep your eye out for the schedule um, in the coming days. Once again, thanks to Harry Winston for your continuing support and commitment to the San Francisco Conservatory. And I am so happy to be here with you guys and uh, have a wonderful holiday season during this Easter and Passover season. Uh, let's stay positive and, and happy and keep the music going. Thank you so much, everyone. Until next time. <laughs>